Friends, I'm Debbie Whaley, and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church, and we're delighted that you've joined us for worship this morning. If you'd like to follow along with the bulletin, you can check the link right below, as well as find the link for our online giving. Friends, as we enter into worship, remember that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And now let's sing our first hymn with joy and passion. Because you love, O Christ, the garden of the world has come to flower. The darkness of the tomb is flooded with your resurrection power. The tomb has rolled away, and death cannot imprison. Oh, sing this Easter day, for Jesus Christ has risen, has risen, has risen, has risen. Because you live, O oh Christ, the spirit bird of hope is freed for flying. Our cages of despair no longer keep us closed and life denying. The stone has rolled away and death cannot imprison. Oh, sing this Easter day, for Jesus Christ has risen, has risen, has risen, has risen. Because you live, O oh Christ, the rainbow of your peace was then creation. The colors of your love will draw The stone has rolled away, and death cannot imprison. Oh, sing this Easter day, for Jesus Christ is risen, has risen, has risen, has risen. Hi, everyone. You know, when we think about what it means to worship, coming to God with the truth of our lives is an act of worship in itself. Acknowledging our shortcomings, trusting that God is interested in our hearts and souls and minds, believing in God's endless grace and mercy are all part of showing our deepest respect for our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we know that when we gather for worship, however that may look, that we gather in reverence to you. And we know that the spirit of worship is meant to extend throughout each day. And yet, sometimes we lose our focus and place other values ahead of yours. You call us to hold fast to that which is good but sometimes that can be hard. Help us to recognize the good that you have created in the world all around us. Call us to cling to you, to center us in these dizzying times. Remind us to worship you with all our heart and all our soul and all our might and to show you our unquestioned devotion. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it great to know that God's grace and mercy are truly without limits? Friends, in all we do, we are forgiven and loved. Thanks be to God. 
Let's sing together our next song, Here I Am to Worship. where you get to come on close to the screen, whether you're watching on your TV or your iPad or your phone, because this is the time for children. This is just for you. So last Sunday was Easter, and it was so wonderful to see all of your pictures of how you worshiped last week. And it's just so funny that they were about how you worshiped, because that's what we're doing at Mount Washington next. We're going to be studying what it is to worship for our next sermon series. And so the question Debbie's going to be talking about is what is worship and where can we worship? Do you think we can only worship in our building? What about here? While social distancing with your friends and FaceTiming with them. Hi. While washing your hands for 20 seconds or more. While making dinner. While loving on your mom? <laughs> While working from home? Playing with your dog. Allie, come here, come here. Going for a walk with your dog? Going to visit your school? Going to a park? At the drive through at Graders? How can I help you? Going to the grocery store? Pumping your gas? Going to the bank? Talking to your buddy Jill in the car. Hi. It's true. You can worship at the grocery store, pumping your gas, playing with your dog, or hugging on your mom. Because worship is not really about a building. It's really about how your heart is tuned to God. So remember, 
Whether you're visiting your school or walking your dog, you can worship God. That's what you are. The scripture reading today consists of two selections, both from the Old Testament. The first is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. And in the Jewish tradition, this is the most recited text of the Old Testament. The second is Exodus 20 verses 1 through 7. Let's listen to the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. 
Let's continue on with Exodus. The Lord spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or is it on the earth beneath, or is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I don't know about all the rest of you, but I am finding I'm moving into a new phase in this COVID-19 crisis. You know, the first few weeks I was kind of excited and it was a challenge and there were all sorts of things on my to-do list that I was sort of making my way through at Home Improvements. But I got to be honest with you, yesterday I just about went nuts. It may be because I live alone, but I don't know, like, like somewhere in the afternoon I just sort of had this tent for tantrum with myself. I was like determined that I had to get out. I didn't want to cook one more meal for myself. I didn't want to, have to worry about going to the grocery store. I didn't want to worry about what kind of mask I had to wear. I was just so fed up. And then I'm reading the news and I'm like, when is this ever going to end? It just felt like the sort of despair and hopelessness and helplessness of this whole situation just really hit me. And I had this rebellious streak. I was like ready to break every single rule that we've been told to keep just because I was frustrated. I was aggravated. I don't like having my freedoms curtailed. And frankly, I miss all of you. I want to see the people I love and care about. I want to give hugs and, and embrace those who mean so much to me. And, you know, after I had my little sort of 15-minute temper tantrum, I started thinking about, well, what did that mean? And what was that all about? But the thing that was really interesting for me is it sort of helped me strip away all, all of these things that sort of are in my life and distill them down to the things that I think are important. What are the things that are most essential for my life, for a thriving um, community, for life that I treasure and value? Well, you know, that got me thinking about some other things, because today was a first for me. I conducted my first wedding using social distancing. Now think about it. This couple, Pam and Felicia, whose uh, wedding was scheduled for May, needed to reschedule their wedding because of all the challenges with the COVID crisis. And because April 15th was an anniversary date for them, they decided to get uh, married on the day that they had their first date, they got engaged, and now this would be their wedding. Knowing that they couldn't have the big party that they were planning on having later on in May, this wedding was a reduction to what was most essential. It wasn't all about the beautiful clothes. It wasn't about all the food or the music or even all the friends. The wedding got stripped down to its most essential components. There were just a few family members all socially distanced from one another, there were two friends that represented all their community that could have been at the wedding. And then there was me, standing six feet away from this amazing couple. But it distilled what the essence of a wedding really is. Not to say that clothes and food and music and friends and family aren't really important. But it was a reminder that a wedding is really all about the commitment between two people who love each other and the promises that they make to one another. You see, the COVID-19 crisis has reduced this wedding ceremony to what is most essential, what is most important, what is at the core heart of what this couple is all about. Well, of course, I found myself thinking about this as everything sort of seems to make me think about things these days. And it reminded me about what we're going to be talking about for the next uh, few weeks, which is 
what's at the core of our worship. I mean, there's been no other time. We've never had a social experiment like this where everything that we know about our regular worshiping habits have been stripped away. It's forcing all of us to look at what is most essential about our worship. I mean, think about it. You know, where are you worshiping today, right? Who were the ushers who, or greeters who welcomed you into worship? Was it a family member or, or maybe a beloved pet? For me, it's cozying down in my favorite chair since I live alone. And that was what welcomed me and warmly invited me into worship. Coffee wasn't served by, uh, by our Common Grounds ministry. Instead, coffee was in my favorite mug, made my the way I love it, as I sat down to worship. You know, the worship was not with a, the big band that's playing or the organ or the choir. It's a more intimate and subtle experience doing this online. It's not about the greeting. It's not about any of it. All of this has made us think and consider what is most essential about our worship. Well, you know, it may feel like everything's changed, but to be really honest, it hasn't. The forms have changed. The methodology of delivery has changed. The people we share worship with may have changed. But at the core of what worship is all about, that hasn't changed one little bit. No. No, it hasn't. That's because the object of our worship, the object of our worship is God. And God is still the thing that orients us and grounds us in our worship. As we looked at these uh, verses today, these are some of the most important verses in all of the Jewish faith. Um, Let me read to you again from Deuteronomy uh, 6, verses 4 through 9. For you see, this is the prayer that every Jewish person uh, recites up to four times a day, twice in the morning, once when they rise and one mid-morning, and then again in the evening, and then right before they go to bed. And you can understand why they do this when you hear this verse. In fact, let me give you an illustration. Sorry about that. My visual aid fell down. This is a picture uh, of a Jewish person. A, a, well, let me get it right. A Jewish man, right? And what he's doing here is he is binding his phylacteries or this very word of God into something that's on his arm. You'll see it right there, right? That's a little box that contains scripture. And then up on his head right here, whoop, that is also a place where the scriptures are bound. Or perhaps you've seen it um, on the side of a, a door as you've entered a home of a Jewish person. As they enter, there's this little box, and that also contains scripture. It's called the mezuzah. And people often touch it as they enter into the house. That's because in this scripture, as you'll hear, uh, God gives a command that is so important and says this is so essential that you should bind this to your head, to your hand, and affix these this scripture or this wisdom to the doorpost. So listen to it. What's so important that God says we need to do all these things in our lives? Deuteronomy 6, starting with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children, talk about them when you're at home and when you stay away, when you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. You see, what is happening here is that in the polytheistic environment, which uh, the Jewish people were a part of, the Israelite people were a part of them. Remember, they had just come out of Egypt with all their pantheon of gods. God is asking them to assert something so critical and so important for who they are as a people. First of all, that there's only one God. The Lord your God, Yahweh, is your God. And that God is God alone. In other words, all the rest of them are pretenders. It would be like saying, um, well, you went to um, 
a store and decided to worship a mannequin instead of having a relationship with a real person, right? It's like, it was a false sense of God's that God was asserting, there's no other God like me. I'm the real deal. I am the first and only, and I am the one that you're supposed to worship. I am the one where your life should be oriented. I am the one is true. And who was it that this God was? I mean, there are all sorts of things that they would have known already about God in this part of the story of the Old Testament. They would have known God as the God of all creation, the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. They saw God as the one who was infinitely creative and also creative and loving towards them. The affirmation in the early parts of the scriptures are that we are made in the very image of God, and that is good. Unlike many of the other uh, gods of that season where human beings were sort of enslaved to those understandings of God, what we see from the opening chapters of Genesis is that God chooses to have a relationship with humanity, one that is in partnership and one that is loving and caring. It's intimate, not impersonal. It's really a remarkable affirmation of God's provision and God's care, something, of course, that these early Israelites would have understood because they were a people that had been brought out of slavery in Egypt and were on their way to the promised land. But the second scriptures that we read today remind us of something else. You may have recalled that that was the beginning of the Ten Commandments, those great commandments that were given to Moses that were meant to be the sort of uh, distillation of all of the law just down in these Ten Commands. And the first of the three Ten Commandments really have to deal with our relationship with God. The second, uh, six, have to do more with the uh, horizontal relationships that we have. Now, what God is saying in this first is that I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. Don't make any uh, idols or other images and worship them instead. And revere my name, reverence my name. Now, some think that the next one, the uh, fourth commandment, which is keeping the Sabbath holy, may also deal with that orientation to God. But I actually believe it's that transition point about how we are to treat ourselves and one another and the rest of the commands that follow. Now, let's look at that vertical dimension, if you will, for a moment. What it says basically is that God is to be the orientation point of our lives. In other words, look up. Look up. The scriptures tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And in this, we are supposed to see the transcendence and the magnificent qualities of God. Not unlike the early Israelites, we're to pay attention to God's care and provision, God's majesty, God's glory. And that is a function of us looking up, looking out beyond ourselves, acknowledging that there is a being, a God who holds us that is bigger than ourselves. But that vertical dimension also has another quality, doesn't it? It's a vertical uh, dimension that also runs through us. It's the Spirit of God, or as, as Paul describes it as, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's where God chooses to dwell, and in that vertical dimension, it goes down deep. It grounds our very being. It, it helps us know who we are, and whose we are. The who we are, of course, is that each one of us is beloved. Each one of us has been crafted in the image of God, and God takes delight in each one of us. God's dressed us with amazing gifts. God is the one who gives us purpose and meaning to our lives. God's the one who values us. So we look up to see this amazing God and see the, the nature of God's very character, magnificence, majesty, and glory. And at the same time, that vertical dimension goes deep within each one of us and reminds us of who we are and that ultimately we belong to God. Now, you see, the reason why this is so important is that it's really easy for us, isn't it, to get really obsessed with sort of the horizontal relationships, and those are where the next six commandments come in. And what God is basically warning the Israelite people and warning us here in these scriptures is that when we let the horizontal dimensions of our life, in other words, the idol worship in our lives, the letting other things crowd into our understanding and experience of God, 
These things can distort when we start here. We can't start on the horizontal plane of how we treat one another or our morals or our ethics. Instead, we have to start with the vertical, the understanding of who God is and the nature of every human being. That's the core of what worship is. And then it's out of that solidarity and understanding of who God is and who we are that our relationships with one another can be put on a plane that is moral and just. You see, if we start with just this horizontal plane first, we start with just the relationships, then it's really relative. We're finding that all over the world today, right? That's sort of the insight of the early 20th century is the relativism of who gets to decide what's right or what's wrong. When we start with human beings and human relationships as first, morals, ethics, all those things become relative to whatever the culture says they happen to be. But that's not at all what we know that God is calling us to do. Because when we orient ourselves on that plane, there are some seductions that may happen, some idols that may be created. When human beings set without any sense of God in their life, what is right, then really it's all about who has the power, isn't it? And that's where the pursuit and the idol of wealth becomes uh, something that can infect a society, where rabid individualism and not seeing yourself as interconnected with everyone else can, can lead to sort of a, a me-at-all-costs sort of attitude. And it also can lead to a sort of uh, whatever your ism is that you are, if you're um, and leaving other people out. So it can lead to all sorts of things like racism and classism or homophobia or uh, gender um, dysphoria in the sense of uh, what people are on top based on what their gender orientation or identity happens to be. You see, that distorts the very image of God that each one of us has inside of us, doesn't it? So what the scriptures are saying is that it's very important that your lives be oriented well. Be oriented well to the God and God alone. It's that vertical dimension that first must be in alignment, and that's what worship is. And then the secondary piece is the relationships will follow. This is why when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He quoted the Shema. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and spirit. And then he said, but the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And over the next few weeks, we're going to actually explore what it means to love God with your whole heart, to love God with your whole soul, to love God with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But today, we need to be reminded that it's that vertical dimension, that vertical dimension that is so important. So how does that play out in terms of our worship life. You see, when this COVID crisis has really been an interesting invitation for all of us to think about what's essential for worship. Is it the building? Well, when we make our focus all about the space where we worship, then we can actually get distracted when that space is gone and find ourselves not aligning ourselves with God as the focus of our worship, but instead only appreciating its building and its aesthetics. Well, what about music then? What if music is something that's important? It helps bring our hearts and, and minds into praise and an attitude of heartfelt gratitude to God. But when worship becomes all about the music, that horizontal dimension again, and isn't first aligned with our understanding of who God is, it can become a little bit distorted. And when we think that the music is more of a priority than the God who we worship, we somehow cloud our understanding of who God is and actually who we are, don't we? Excuse me, I need to pick up this one more piece of paper. It's sort of hard doing this online, I think. So when we think about what it is that true worship really is, I really want to think about that we don't think about worship as like a commodity or something that we we own. Like, think about worship for a second as if it were a car. 
you know, when we go down and we want to buy a car, right? We want to drive a car. We go down to the dealer or the shop or we look around online for a good used car. We have a whole list of things, right? Probably lots of things that we wish that we could get in that car. And as long as that car has the majority of our bells and whistles for the price that we want, we are in control and so happy, right? Leather or uh, cloth seats, check. Fast, slow, good gas mileage, check. Can it, does it have enough room to haul around all the stuff I need to haul around? Check. Is it reliable? Check. And then we sort of take that car for a test drive and then eventually that car is ours. We turn the key, clink, and that car takes us wherever we want to go. Guess who that car is all about? It's about us, isn't it? It's about what I want. It's about what I think I need. And it's all about what direction that car is going to take me because I'm the one who's all in control. Well, you see, when we think about worship in those terms, it really distorts worship, doesn't it? I mean, worship isn't really worship when it's all about our preferences. You see, true worship is when our hearts are aligned with God. The Lord your God alone is God. And that's where that priority needs to be, that first vertical direction. And then the secondary level, the human level, the, the preferences that we have for worship are secondary to that primary focus of worshiping God and God alone. As we move into this series uh, for the next few weeks, let's just remember this great verse that comes from the ancient text of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. And you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the scriptures tell us this is so important that we are to affix it to our hands, the hands that serve. It is so important that we're to affix it to our foreheads, to our minds. All that we think should be under submission of God. It is meant to be put at the doorposts of our house, the very heart of our lives. And it encourages us to train our children to love God as passionately and as completely as we can. For this... Uh, Ten Commandments start this way. The Lord your God, have no other gods before him. Let us worship God and God alone. Amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within Though the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, 
for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, though the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. This morning, our prayer comes to us in the form of a bidding prayer. At the end of each statement, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond with, hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Let's pray. Adonai Elohim, God of Abraham and Isaac, of ancient promises and prophecies, hear your children pray this morning. We pray for the doctors, the nurses, the janitors, the food delivery people, all people who work in the medical field, we pray for their strength, perseverance, and love as they battle COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the scientists, the researchers, who continue to lead us towards a vaccine. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. We pray for our country and its leaders as they lead by example and show us how to live in isolated times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And lastly, Lord, we pray for our church and our community that even in these times, we will remember to live as people of Easter, people of resurrection and life with Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Children of God, join me in singing our final hymn, Take My Life, verses 1, 5, and 6.
My friends, I want to give you this benediction today. The benediction is from Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power of his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And I pray that you have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the goodness of God. Amen. I'm the pastor at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you joined us for worship this morning. If you'd like to give online, click the link below. Have a great day.